In this histology video, we are going to focus on the cells located in the distal part of the esophagus, more specifically on the C line, and how changes in these cells cause a disease known as Barrett's esophagus, which predisposes to esophageal cancer. Welcome to a brand new class on DNMD, where you can learn everything related about the basic sciences of medical knowledge and apply it to patient care in the future or right now. Barrett's esophagus is the condition in which any extent of metaplastic columnar epithelium replaces the stratified squamous epithelium that lines the distal esophagus. But what does this mean? Remember that in the second video of esophageal histology, we talked about the C-line being the union of the stratified squamous epithelium of the esophagus with the simple columnar epithelium of the stomach. Well, Barrett's esophagus develops through a process known as metaplasia, which basically means that one type of fully differentiated tissue with its cells is replaced by a completely different type of tissue and cells. In this case, the normal epithelium of the distal esophagus is replaced by a simple columnar epithelium. This causes the C-line, also known as the squamocolumnar junction, to migrate superiorly from its normal position. But why? Metaplasia commonly is a consequence of long-standing inflammation. In the esophagus, it is caused by recurrent reflux of gastric acid or bile, which leads to chronic reflux esophagitis. Picture it like this. The esophageal mucosa is being burned. The normal response would be to generate more squamous cells to heal that burn. But for reasons not well understood, columnar cells are generated through metaplasia. There are some hypotheses as to how this happens. Migration of stem cell from the gastric cardia, expansion of residual embryonic type cells located in the gastroesophageal junction, or circulating stem cells from the bone marrow are transported to the damaged esophagus. Demetaplastic columnar cells of Barrett's esophagus are more resistant to reflux-induced injury than the normal squamous cells. However, these metaplastic cells predispose to the development of esophageal adenocarcinoma. That means that Barrett's esophagus is a precancerous lesion, so it's very important to diagnose it. But how to diagnose Barrett's esophagus? One might think that with such an important disease, clear guidelines should be available. However, there is no clear consensus on the diagnostic criteria of Barrett's esophagus between the US and the UK. We are going to discuss the difference between these two approaches so you can decide which to follow. Two diagnostic criteria should be fulfilled in order to diagnose Barrett's esophagus. Number 1. By using endoscopy, one must see the metaplastic columnar epithelium lining the distal esophagus at least 1 cm or more above the gastroesophageal junction. To identify the gastroesophageal junction via endoscopy, you should look out for the proximal limit of the gastric folds, meaning that the gastroesophageal junction is the limit right where the gastric folds are beginning to appear. The columnar epithelium of Barrett's esophagus has a reddish color and velvet-like texture on endoscopic examination, whereas the squamous epithelium has a pale, glossy appearance as we can see in this endoscopy. This metaplastic columnar epithelium can appear as circumferential, in the shape of tongues, or as an Iceland pattern, meaning that Icelands of columnar epithelium alternate with squamous epithelium. To record the length of Barrett's esophagus, we use the break criteria, which uses two measurements. Number one, the circumferential extent, represented by the letter C, and number two, the maximum extent, represented by the letter M. It is measured in centimeters and starting at the gastroesophageal junction. For example, in this endoscopy, we should first identify the gastric folds to locate the gastroesophageal junction. Then we locate the upper limit of the columnar epithelium that lines the entire esophageal circumference. The distance between the gastroesophageal junction and this upper limit will be C, in this case 2 centimeters. Finally, we identify the longest tongue of columnar epithelium. The distance between the gastroesophageal junction and the upper limit of this tongue will be M, in this case 5 cm. As you can tell, M should always be longer than C. This endoscopy has a Barrett's of C2M5, according to the Prague system. If there are any lesions present, like for example masses or ulcers, the endoscopy should classify them according to the Paris classification. If you would like to know more, I'll put the link right here once I have created the video explaining the Paris classification. 
An important thing to remember is that endoscopies don't have a microscopic vision, meaning that just endoscopy is not enough to diagnose Barrett's esophagus. We need to look at the cells. Therefore, the final step in endoscopy is to take biopsies of the deceased esophagus, following the Seattle biopsy protocol, which includes taking random biopsies from four different quadrants every two centimeters, starting one centimeter above the gastroesophageal junction, as well as taking biopsies of any visible lesions. The second criteria to diagnose Barrett's esophagus is the histological examination of said biopsies. And here is where the lack of consensus appears. Three types of columnar epithelia can appear in Barrett's esophagus. Number one, cardiac epithelium, which has a foveolar surface, meaning that it has many pits, and has glands with mucus secreting cells as we can see here. Number two, the gastric fundic type epithelium, also known as the oxyntocardiac epithelium, which has a foveolar surface as well, mucus secreting cells, and also chief and parietal cells. It resembles the histology of the gastric fundus. And finally, number three, specialized intestinal metaplasia. It has intestinal type cribs, lined with mucus secreting columnar cells, and has goblet cells. Remember goblet cells? We talked about them in the glandular epithelia video. According to the American Gastroenterological Association, the term Barrett's esophagus should only be used when intestinal metaplasia is present, meaning that goblet cells need to be present in the biopsy in order to diagnose Barrett's esophagus. The justification being that intestinal metaplasia has the greatest risk of progression to esophageal adenocarcinoma. On the other hand, according to the British Society of Gastroenterology, the presence of only a columnar epithelium, regardless of the presence of intestinal metaplasia, is enough to diagnose Barrett's esophagus, meaning that the presence of goblet cells is not needed for the diagnosis, the justification being that intestinal metaplasia is not the only type known to progress to adenocarcinoma, and that biopsies taken might not show intestinal metaplasia, even though an area of the patient's esophagus might indeed have intestinal metaplasia but was not biopsied. Therefore, these patients that don't have goblet cells on the biopsy should not be lost to surveillance and follow-up. Finally, another type of epithelium known as multilayer epithelium has been described as a possible early transitional phase to columnar metaplasia. As we can see here, it is characterized by multiple layers of cells with squamous appearance but with columnar cells on top. So remember, to diagnose Barrett's esophagus you need number one, the endoscopic appearance, and number two, the histological evidence of columnar metaplasia with or without goblet cells, depending on with whom you agree. And that's it for today's video. In the next video we'll talk about other esophageal pathologies where histology comes in handy. If you would like to read more about the topics discussed in this video, I'll put my reference down below in the description. Also, if you have any questions, please don't doubt to write it in the comment section. Before you do, make sure that your question wasn't asked already. If it has, please give that question a like, and the three questions with the most likes will be answered in the next video. Hey guys, thanks for watching! And remember, it's always for our patients. If you like this video and the content I make, please don't forget to subscribe, like and share this video. With your help, I'm sure we can get free medical content to every corner of this world.